Hi, I'm Mitch Gallagher. Welcome to Sweetwater's Guitars and Gear. We have a special guest joining us in the studio today. Chris Martin is here. Great to see you. Thanks. Thanks for taking time out of your busy schedule to yeah. sit down with us. Yeah. Pleasure to be here. You did uh, a couple of talks for the sales engineers this yes. morning. You have a public event yeah, tonight, and yeah. tomorrow there's a big event going yeah, yeah. on. So yep, yep. Keeping you busy while yeah, you're here. That's all right. Yeah, that's wonderful. It's your first time here, right? Yes. After all these years, I finally made it. Oh, we're glad to have you. I saw you, t you went down the slide. Yep. <laughs> What'd you think? Yeah, that's fine. I, my daughter should be here. She'd, yeah, right, right. <laughs> she'd still be out there. Yeah, right, exactly. <laughs> so tell us, what was it like growing up Martin? Yeah. Surrounded by all of that? Uh, well, I hate to disappoint you, but my parents were divorced when I was three. Mm -hmm. And it was not an amicable divorce. And my mom really actually kept me away <laughs> from that side of my family. I would go back and visit uh, in the summer, usually stay with my grandparents. Um, I would go to the plant and fool around, you know, do things like pack strings. Uh, but I, th you know, as I got a little older, and I don't even know if you could do this today, I did get a chance to work down in the machine room. Mm -hmm. And my job was Donald Fritz, he ran the Tanowitz bandsaw, and he would take the large, long mahogany planks, cut them into trapezoidal shapes, and then he taught me how to mark out necks using a form and a pencil, mm -hmm. and then he would cut the neck blanks out, but I was allowed with a stick to push the fall off into the dumpster. So nice. that was my first experience out in the plant. Now, whether or not they would, al would today we, we would even let a, an 11-year-old do that, I don't know, right. but, but it was fun. <laughs> right, probably some insurance issues yeah. there at some point. Yeah. So you went to business school and then returned to the well, company, I, you know, then, then by, by high school, you know, I would, I would work there in the summer, and people would ask, are you going to join the family business? I was actually going to be a marine biologist. My vision was to go to the University of Miami and scuba dive all day. Mm -hmm. um, and a friend of my father's came to visit, a fellow named Fred Wallachie and he had a music store in LA. And he said, he said, I get it, you want to get out of Dodge, but since you have an interest in the business, why don't you come out to California? UCLA, UCLA will take you, because you're out of state, mm -hmm. and I'll give you a job in my music store. I said, oh, great. So I go out to California. It's a bit of a fish out of water out there. Um, I never felt I was quite hip enough you know, to <laughs> be with the in crowd. And what I realized when I worked in the music store is I knew nothing about my family's business. And it really, it, it embarrassed me. Fred was very gracious about it. Mm -hmm. But I thought, you know, this is silly. He's putting me out there as Mr. Martin, young Mr. Martin, and I don't even know who Mr. Martin is. So I called my mom up and I said, you know, I'm, I'm quitting college. Silence on the phone. <laughs> right. And I'm coming back and I'm going to work out in the shop and, you know, try and get a feel for this business. And she said, well, you, you still need to go back to college. I said, I know. Came back, worked, lived with my grandfather, which was, he, he and I really, we, we connected. Mm -hmm. And... Uh, worked in the shop during the day, and he said, hey, there's a local community college that you should go to. So I went to community college at night. And you know what I learned? I, 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 I did kind of a fast track through the shop. Some of the jobs I could do, some of them required a lot more training than I had time. Mm -hmm. But I came away from that experience with a great deal of respect for my colleagues who do that level of craftsmanship day in and day out. And that, that was really beneficial to me. Sure. Um, you know, Bob Taylor is a guitar builder. I love guitar building. I'm actually kind of dangerous with a chisel. <laughs> so I work the front of the house. <laughs> right, right, right. I had a chance to, uh, to visit Martin a few years mm -hmm. back, and uh, you graciously gave us a tour of the, the museum. Yeah. But, uh, and it was fascinating. And equally fascinating was walking through the, the floor and watching those craftsmen, some of them who, who have been working there for yeah. decades. Yep. And what amazed me is how fast they are. Yeah. You're watching them with chisels and, yep. and yep. All, all the different tools and yep. kind of going, should you really be going that fast? Yeah. Should you really, shouldn't yeah. you be careful? Well, you Man, know, it, it's perfect every time. It's a factory. Yeah. And when we hire you, we say, you know, first of all, it's quality. Mm -hmm. But quantity is important, too. Mm -hmm. And we'll spend a lot of time training you and finding the right jobs. You know, some people are good at some things and not others. But right. once you find that sweet spot, then it works. Yeah, it's amazing to watch yeah. them. It really, yeah. really is something. And we also, the other thing is it's multi-generational. Mm -hmm. the, the relationships... You would need a three-dimensional family tree to track all the relationships between all the people that work there. Right, right. That's part of what makes the guitar special. Yep. I have two uh, Martins myself, and I, I absolutely, one of which I bought after that trip. Actually, I, I, I played it there on the floor, yeah, and it yeah, showed up here. Right. And Well, that's why we give tours. You know, right. the guitars, they've never been cheap, <laughs> and right. they're more expensive today than ever. But you get someone halfway, two-thirds of the way through the tour, and they're like, oh, now I understand why they're so expensive. Right, right. So it's unusual for a, a company 
it, you've lasted since 1833, and obviously going stronger yeah. than ever. Yeah, yeah. Uh, uh, I was fascinated listening to your story this morning, uh, how uh, uh, C.F. Martin Sr. Mm -hmm. uh, basically left Germany because of the guild system that was there, and that's how yeah. he kind of ended up in, in the U.S. Can you talk a little bit about yeah. that early history of the company? He grew up in a town where they made violins. He was a cabinet maker with his father, took an interest in the guitar. The violin makers at that point discouraged him. They said, ah, fad, folk instrument, don't get involved. Right. His father got him a job in Vienna, worked for Johann Stauffer, came back after several years figuring, okay, now I know what I'm doing, going to go home, make guitars. Well, while he was away, the violin makers got into the guitar business, and they used the argument that in Germany, to practice a trade or craft, you have to apprentice in that particular trade or craft. And they said, you're a cabinet maker in Germany. Whatever you did in, in Austria, that's a whole different country. And at some point, I think he just said, look, I'm not doing it all over. You know, I, I, I feel confident enough that I, I can make guitars, you know, under my own brand. And he came to the new world and found success. Right, right. Initially in New York. New York City. He was in New York City for six years. Mm -hmm. And uh, when he moved, when the family moved to Pennsylvania, they kept the property. And in hindsight, I wish they had kept it and kept yeah. it and kept it. Right? Yeah, they, right. sold, they sold it at one point, probably for cash flow. Right. That, hey, you know, right. we've got this rental property in New York. It's going up in value. We need to buy some new equipment or put, a, put an addition on the factory. It's, you know, so it, Right, <laughs> right. So you're the sixth generation yeah. to, uh, to be Yeah, I'm uh, CF the fourth. There were two Franks. I'm not sure why. It was CF Senior, CF Junior, Frank Henry, CF the third, my grandfather, Frank Herbert, my dad, me, and now there's my daughter, Claire Francis. Seventh just generation. Just in case. Yeah, just, just in, in case. case. <laughs> right, right. So do you feel a, a tremendous responsibility because of that, uh, that uh, legacy that's been passed down through the generations? You know, I do, but I'm so fortunate to be surrounded by, as you, I think, felt when you were there, folks that they get it. They understand how precious this thing is, and they help me mm -hmm. preserve it and enhance it. You know, it's, I like to say to my colleagues, I say, look, none of us is as smart as all of us. And they're making the best of its kind. Right. You know, you, you just know they come to work, or they're somewhere and say, where do you work? I work at Martin Guitar. We make the best guitars in the world. Mm -hmm. You know, doesn't get much better than that. Yeah, right, right. It's awesome to be able to say that. So the company has, has through the, the years and through the decades, mm -hmm. uh, from, from my perspective, looking at it back historically, seem to be very adept at watching what's happening. Yeah. And uh, you used the word pivoting right. this morning when you yeah. were talking about yeah. it to, 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 uh, to be in line with what mm -hmm. was popular at the time. Yeah. Ukuleles yeah. And, uh, and then steel strings. Steel yeah. strings, sure. Yeah, and, and some fascinating stories are the one that really caught my eye is uh, I studied classical guitar. Okay. And, uh, you said that Segovia was really the reason that Martin shifted to steel string construction. That's what George Gruen told me, and I, you know, generally I trust what George says. And, right. and his point was that, you know, up until that point, as I said earlier this morning, early in our history, Spanish guitars didn't travel well. They just didn't make the transition from a warm, humid Mediterranean climate to the northeast of the U.S. Mm -hmm. And this, that's, so that's in the 1840s. That's why CF began to copy them and made a more durable American version of a Spanish classic guitar. Well, when Segovia came to America in the 20s, the Spanish builders had improved their craft and the guitars were more durable. And Segovia basically endorsed them and the market listened. Mm -hmm. And they moved away from Martin gut string guitars and we out of necessity, took the strings that were already available on the banjo and the mandolin, adapted them to the guitar by beefing up the guitar. Mm -hmm. And that's, that's always a challenge when, when you're building an acoustic, a resonant instrument like that is, particularly w with a company like ours where you know, we offer a lifetime guarantee. Right. So we don't want it to fall apart, but if you overbuild the guitar, you're giving up the tone. And so there was a period of trial and error there. Okay, now we've got these steel strings. If we don't beef it up, the thing's got a pretzel on you, you know, right. banana on you. But if we beef it up too much, we're going to lose one of the things we're known for, which is the sound. And that period, I mean, out of that came the golden era. Because then we put the 14 fret on, mm -hmm. 14 fret neck with the narrow neck with the radius fingerboard, and it just worked. Yeah. Right, right. That was, that was quite a story that you told, and I wasn't aware of that. I always actually kind of wondered how you had gone from the 12 fret yeah. neck to the 14 yeah. fret. Can you tell us a little bit about that? In our case, it was a particular customer, a fellow named Perry Bechtel, who was a very well-known vaudeville banjo player. Mm -hmm. And by the end of the Roaring Twenties, he sort of saw vaudeville going away. And he said, I'm too young to retire. I'm going to switch to the guitar. But, you know, even though the guitars had steel strings, they had a classic neck. 
wide, flat fingerboard, 12 fret to the body. And he's like, I'm banging into the body here and this neck is so wide I can't play it. Right. Can you make me a guitar with a 15 fret neck? And we're like, no. So we borrowed, we did not invent, we borrowed from the arch top, the 14 fret narrow neck radius fingerboard neck that was already there, mm -hmm. squared off the shoulders of our 12 fret guitars. And he's like, yeah. And we thought if he likes it, maybe other people will and sure enough. Right. Off to the races. Right. Obviously a success. Yeah. That's what yeah. That. There was kind of a similar story with the X bracing, which originally uh, emerged because of kind of practical considerations. Yeah, the X bracing goes all the way back. Um, there has recently been a book written about the evolution of the X brace because it's as meticulous as our records are, there were no diaries, and unfortunately, there was no opportunity like this in 1839 to interview C.F. Senior. Right. So we have to, you know, we have to kind of piece together the story from the guitars and from our records. And what we discovered was that traditional Spanish guitar, which C.F. was copying, if you tie the, st the strings on the bridge, no problem. But he also was making pin bridge guitars with a little brass ferrule like today, like the Steel Street, a brass mm -hmm. ferrule, put it in there, you anchor it, and you put a pin in. And we believe what was happening, because he was using fan bracing, that at the end he's aligning everything, and one of the last things you do is put the bridge on. After you figure out, okay, now that I've got this thing built, where does the bridge go? And it can move a little bit. Mm -hmm. And we think he would put the bridge on, and if it was a pin bridge, and he drilled hole through the holes for the pins, and then he went inside, he's like, oh, geez, I drilled right through a brace. So he began to move the braces out of the way over time. It mm -hmm. wasn't like he went from fan bracing to X bracing. It was a step process of you know six or eight years, and at the end of which he came up with that X brace, right. which when we went to the steel string, really worked, mm -hmm. really worked. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And of course, the trademark of the, the company now. Yes, and, now I will wide, tell wide you, used is I will tell you, um, the only thing we really ever trademarked was the brand. Mm -hmm. You know, people say, why didn't you patent the X-Brace? Why didn't you patent the Dreadnought? Well, even if we had, the patents would have run out. Sure. And, you know, in a way, it, it's what better endorsement than when everyone who competes with you uses your designs as a jumping off point. Right. You know, I, that's what, it, what an endorsement. Sure. They're making a Dreadnought. Why? Because it's worth making. They're using X-Bracing. Why? Because it works. Right. <laughs> right, right. Absolutely. Absolutely. So over the, over the, Past well during your tenure, yeah. uh, uh, Martin has done a number of signature uh, instruments yeah. with uh, yeah. with famous artists. Can you tell us a little bit about how that happens? How I you can. choose an artist? And sure, how that works? sure. When I became chairman and CEO, I was getting I will tell you a lot of pressure from the salesmen, and they said, "Chris, we need artist endorsements." And I said, "We've got artists." So they said, "Well, we need to more formalize it." You know, we've famous people have always used Martin guitars, and they said, "Can is there a way we can do it more formally?" And I thought, there is, but I don't want to mistreat this privilege. I don't want people to say, oh, we know why they're playing a Martin, because Martin pays them. It's like, no, we never paid anybody. They self-selected. I have a good friend in, in, who lives in Los Angeles, and before the NAMM show, I always go and hang out with him. So many, many years ago, I said, I, I want to go see Gene Autry's D45. He said, oh, it's at his museum over in Griffith Park. Let's go. So we go over, and I, I thought this would be just, you know, singing cowboy tchotchke over the top. Well, it was there, but Gene was also a serious collector of all things Western. Hmm. Western tooled saddles, handguns, oil paintings. It was, it was really an impressive collection. Sure enough, there's his guitar. I thought, man, I saw it. We're, we're leaving, and I walk through the gift shop, and I go, wow. Reproduction Gene Autry lunchboxes. Reproduction Gene Autry pen knives. So I come home, huh. so I called the museum up and I said, may I speak to the director? And it was a woman named Joanne Hale and I introduced myself and I said, a couple weeks ago I was out. She said, oh, why didn't you stop and say hello? She said, my husband Monty was a singing cowboy and he's got a Martin guitar and we, we had a rapport. I said, I have an idea. She said, what's that? I said, I would love to make a reproduction of Gene's D45. Now we made 91 D45s before the war. Mm -hmm. His was unique, and then they became 14 fret solid head, but I'd really love to do that. I would love to donate one of the reproductions to the museum, and I would like to take part of the proceeds from the sale of the rest of them and donate them to the museum. Gene was still alive, and I thought, you know, I bet he would appreciate more a donation to the museum. I mean, he owned real estate, he owned the California Angels. You know, to say to someone like Gene Autry, would you like more money? 
Right. She's like, uh, not really. But when I said, what about giving it to the museum? She said, let me give him a call. She called me back and she said, call Mrs. Autry. So I never talked to Jean. My grandfather met Jean and talked to him, but I never did. And I talked to Mrs. Autry and she said, oh, Jean's so excited about this. He remembers working with your grandfather, designing that first D45. She said, but he doesn't think you're giving enough money to the museum. <laughs> so we did a little horse trading and that became the template. Because uh -huh. you look at, you know, you think about someone who's at that point in their career, they have some charity or many charities, or they have their, their own personal foundation. We found the same thing with Eric Clapton, mm -hmm. that he had that rehab center down in the Caribbean, and that's where the proceeds from the Clapton guitars went. And he's like, this is perfect. Right. You know? I look good, you look good, people get to play guitars. So, right, yeah. right, right, right. So uh, tell us a little bit about the, the situation with tone woods. Yeah, you know, there's yeah. a lot of talk about what's happening yep. with those, and, and, and obviously and that's rightly so. and near and dear to an yeah. acoustic guitar builder. Yeah. First uh, of all, I think it's worth acknowledging that the very traditional acoustic guitar tone woods were selected by guitar builders before my family even got in the business. That's how far back it mm -hmm. goes. Right. I can't tell you who exactly. I don't think it was one person. It was probably trial and error. And then you think back also, so we're going back 190, 200 years that they were able to get these exotic timbers to Europe and take them you know, from a tree to a board to a veneer and make a guitar out of it. Right. And so that's what we used. Well, of course you use rosewood for the back and sides. Of course you use mahogany for the neck. Of course you use ebony for the fingerboard and the bridge. And of course you use spruce for the top. It got a little easier when we came to America because Central and South America was closer to North America than it was Europe. Right. Um, but over time, and Brazilian rosewood is the best example of a wood that was over-harvested for a variety of reasons, mm -hmm. not just musical instruments. And so there was an embargo. And that's why we moved to Indian rosewood. That's also why we developed the D35 with the three-piece back. So you fast forward to today, where the guitar is more popular than ever, right. and it's incumbent upon us, the guitar builders, and you, the guitar retailers, to begin to talk to the consumer about alternatives. That, that there's just not going to be enough of those traditional woods to satisfy the demand worldwide going forward. Right. And, you know, what I like to say to people, oh, Chris, you know, what I, I want the best wood and I want the most traditional woods. And I'll say, yes, it's called a D45. <laughs> right. And I'll be glad to fix you up. But, you know, not every guitar is, we're just not going to be able to. So we've got to begin to look. There's other um, tropical hardwoods mm -hmm. that, that work. There's temperate hardwoods that work. And then one of the things that I like, and, and I may get this wrong, but they're really there. They started as a tree, but somewhere between the tree and them ending up on the guitar, the material itself was manipulated by man. Mm -hmm. And a good example is the high pressure laminate that we use on the X series, the Stratabon neck, the rich light fingerboard. The roots of those products go back to a tree, but somewhere along the way, man processed them into something that was more manufacturable right. than just a board cut from a tree. Right, right. And also alternatives. Uh, this morning, uh, Craig Thatcher was uh, demonstrating uh, some of the custom shop, yeah. beautiful, beautiful instruments. Yep. And one was a, uh, a, a dreadnought made from sapele. Right. And yeah. beautiful, beautiful yeah, sound. Yeah, is a cousin of mahogany. Mm -hmm. yep. Right, has that same kind of a, a tonality. Yeah. And uh, you know, sometimes guitar players are kind of conservative. I know I am, you know, you, uh, for example, uh, I saw Michael Hedges play and was desperate to have a D28 after that because, yeah. of course, that's what he played. But sure. I ended up with a D35 yeah. because when I played one, it was perfect. Okay. I love the sound of it. Yep. And I still have the guitar. Yep. It's, it's, it's incredible. Yep. So, you know, you have to be a little bit open-minded right. to, uh, right. to things maybe better. Yeah. You know, like yeah, I said, one of the things I, I, I get a kick out of is I'll hear stories and, you know, a retailer will say, yep, I got this D28 in. customer came in and he did not like it. And I thought, oh, man, did they send me a bad one? And he said... A couple days later, a customer came in, same guitar, fell madly in love with it, right. and couldn't leave the store without it. Right. So it is a, it's a very personal thing. Right, right, exactly, exactly. So uh, 1833, yep. the 200th anniversary is a little ways yeah. off. Yeah, but, but you know what we did just accomplish this year is we built the 2 millionth Martin. Oh, wow. 
And it's going to be at the NAMM show. Oh, nice. Yeah. Nice. Yeah. We had the millionth here. Yeah, oh, good. We demonstrated that one yeah, and, good, uh, good. and uh, uh, several of the other anniversary guitars, uh -huh. the, the really highly ornate yeah, ones, have, yeah. have been here to Sweetwater for, for a demonstration. So okay. I can't wait to see the two million. Yeah, it's, it's, it's a thing. Yeah, I bet. <laughs> I bet. Have you started thinking toward the 200th anniversary? Uh, too far away. Too far no, away? Oh, no, yeah, no, no. Not one, one thing on the time. radar? No. <laughs> right, right. Other than, you know, it'll come soon enough. <laughs> sure. Sure, absolutely. Well, Chris, we thank you for taking time to sit oh, with us today. I'm, I'm so uh, glad I finally made it here. What, yeah, a, what a treat. Well, please come back. Ride the slide some more. Yeah, all right. Bring Good your back. daughter to ride the slide. Okay, here. thanks. Great to see you. Thank you. Yep. And thank you for joining me for Sweetwater's Guitars and Gear. I'm Mitch Gallagher.